God is good. Amen. Amen. Let's rise up to our feet and open with a word of prayer. We're here to worship Jesus. Amen. I know we have some members away for the for holiday trips already. Um, I've got some family coming into town later this week. It's going to be a lot of fun to connect. Lord Jesus, I thank you for just every day. Lord, an opportunity to walk with you, to bless you, to live for you. Lord, I thank you for this morning and, and brothers and sisters in Christ gathered here today. Lord Jesus, as we lift up our voices, Lord, I pray that you would be blessed and honored. Lord, we, we welcome you into this place. Lord, we know that you are, you are everywhere always. Lord, you're omnipresent, but there certainly are moments where uh, you just you're, you manifest your presence in a special way. And Lord, we look to you today. Would you come and meet us this morning? We need you, Lord. Amen. Let's, uh, let's lift our voices, worship Jesus, and bless him together. Amen. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign we are here for you. We are here for you. your breath come from heaven
joyful shout make a joyful shout and oftentimes I think to myself well yeah like your response to the Lord when you recognize who he is his goodness the fact that he saved you redeemed you what else would your response be and this morning I realized well I was thinking about it and I thought another way that you use a shout is to get someone's attention and sometimes I think we almost need to get our own souls attention and to say, wake up, you sleeping in there. I don't want to just play church today. I'm here to meet with the living God. We get to do that. That is a privilege. It is an honor. We get to meet with the living God. And right now, I just want you to set your expectations high. To say, I'm here to meet God. I'm here to see him. I'm here to hear him. I'm here for him to change my heart. Oh, Lord, let us see you in a new way. Let us just shake off the slumber. Shake off the slumber of our souls, God. Let us make a shout as we say, yes, we are here to enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. Amen. There were walls between us. By the cross, you came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us. By your grace, we are no longer bound. No longer bound. Sing it again. There were walls between us. By the cross, you came and broke them
his glory. Do the wonder of his grace, the power of salvation. Do that pull me from the grave. This hope is not empty. And forever he will reign. And you won't be part to shame. Now my soul, sing to the God of the ages. Sing to the Lord of all creation. Don't praise you.
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just feel stirred by the Holy Spirit to exhort us in, in earnestness and, and a pursuit of the Lord. Um, this is a call for all of us, but I want to I specifically exhort the men here in the midst. There's, a, there's an admonition to prayer in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And Paul writes, and he instructs the church, he says this, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. And uh, it, it's, it's a rich passage, and there's a lot to, to study here and to learn here. But there's an exhortation for the people of God to be a people who are about the business of the Lord, who are people of the presence of God, who are, who are earnest, who are, who are desperate, and who are, who are expressing that. And, and there's a call to the men of the church to, to be engaged and even leading in this way. There, there's a tendency for everyone, but especially men. It seems to be a besetting sin. It might even go right back in Genesis 3 and the curse you see this. Just a, a tendency towards passivity. There's a call to labor, and you might work hard 50 hours a week, but there's a call to labor at pressing into the presence of God. And, and to, to show that and even be an example and to lead in it. And I want to call us men of God this morning as we pray as we worship. And, and by the way, all these songs, that they're, they're prayers. Don't be like, well, we'll pray later. And then no, no, right now, let's press into the Lord. And certainly lifting up a hand does not equal earnest and sincere. But man, there's something that happens when we say, Jesus, I need to seek you with all that I am. And I'm going to lift up my hands. I'm going to press in and recognize I need the Lord. I need to meet God today. And just as we worship church, Every one of us, men, women, let's press in. But men, let's reject passivity. Let's press in and let's model and be an example and lead the way in earnestly pursuing the Lord today. Let's lift up holy hands as we submit ourselves to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
To hear you say that I'm your friend And you are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else could take Lord, you are good. Lord, I thank you for your presence. Lord, we were created by you and for you. Mm. Draw us, Lord. Draw us, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that as we 
As we pursue you, Lord, as we seek you, as we draw near to you, you draw near to us. Lord, you are near. We find you and we seek. Lord, you are the rewarder of those who diligently seek you. And the reward is, it's you, it's your presence. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. We bless you today. We honor you today. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. You may have a seat. Amen, amen. Welcome. It is great to be with all of y'all today. God is worthy. Amen. I want to give a special welcome to anyone who's with us for the very first time. Um, Other than this, we won't put you on the spot at all, but we do have some packets with some info about the church and a book that we'd love to give you. It's a short, simple read just about the gospel. So if this is your first time, could you just raise your hand up nice and high, and Greg's got those packets. Any first-time visitors? No. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Welcome. Good to have you. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Brilliant. Uh, It's great to have you. It's great to be together. God is worthy. Amen. What we're going to do in just a moment is dismiss the children to their program uh, towards the front of the building. Typically, we have a program for children ages 8 and under, but we're doing a Christmas uh, presentation, and it's been opened up for children 12 years and under. So uh, parents, if you're interested, you can bring your kids there. And uh, what we're going to do right now is dismiss for that, and I want to invite everybody, grab a drink, greet somebody. We'll be back in a few minutes.
Amen. If I could ask you to find your way back to your seats, we'll continue in just a moment. Okay, excellent. Hey, Thanksgiving is coming up. I have not heard much reference to this fact, but this Thanksgiving is the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving. It was in 1621. Uh, nobody knows the exact date, but it was kind of late in the harvest, so probably September to November, somewhere in that range. And uh, the, the, I think the community at that point had been halved. Maybe about half of them had starved or frozen to death in the prior year. And, uh, but the Lord had really used the, uh, I cannot remember the people. Uh, what, what was the, the native tribe? The Wampoa, Wampanoa? Does anybody remember the tribe? God had used them to really like save the, the pilgrims. And they, they did a feast. They had 90 uh, Indian warriors join them, and they just feasted on the crops and deer, and I doubt they had turkey, but, you know, it's good food. But that was 400 years ago. And in the midst of that, I mean, I'm at, we've had a tough year, but it is not the case that half of us have starved or frozen to death. Um, people have been through some tough seasons over the years, but in the midst of it, the testimony of the people of God again and again and again is God is good God is faithful. We can give thanks in everything and rejoice always in obedience to scripture. And so, uh, you know, holidays are just holidays, but it's, it's pretty fun to have a holiday centered around giving thanks to the Lord and recognizing his goodness. Um, speaking of giving thanks to the Lord, it's great to have Louisa and Nick with us. It's been many weeks with both of them. And uh, Nick wanted to just kind of share with the body real quick. Congratulations, by the way. This is your first time here since your son was born. Um, yeah, I just wanted to extend my thanks to everyone for all the prayers. Like, it was amazing to find out, like, that there's a real army out there of people that were praying for us. Um, with, you know, early on, it was a lot of touch and go, and there's a lot of uncertainty, and we were praying and just trusting that you know, God was going, you know, he was being faithful and that, he, you know, our, my son was going to be healed and my wife was going to be healed and things were going to be good and all the prayers meant a lot to us. And I even found that it extended beyond this church to other churches and some of the people I worked with, too, um, that were, you know, praying for us as well. So I just want to say we are truly thankful. Um, and Morgan and my son will be joining us in a couple weeks. We're just giving them some more time to heal and grow a little bit. Awesome. So, Amen. Yes. That's great. Thanks, Nick. Amen. Last week, we prayed for Allison Fitzpatrick. She's a member of CFC over at our Moira location. Um, she's, she has COVID, a pr pretty uh, ex extreme case, and she's in Plattsburgh on a ventilator. Uh, I've, I've seen a couple of updates this week, and it seems like she's, in a, she's moving in a better direction, but still pretty sick. Does anybody have any, like, remark? Is she still in the ventilator? Or? Okay. Okay, that works. Um, but yeah, I heard she's doing uh, better, but she's still sick. So let's just pray for this morning and, and just agree together to, to ask the Lord to completely heal her and bring her back. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you for Allison. And uh, I pray, Lord Jesus, would you touch her body, strengthen her, I pray. Lord God, I pray that she would know your presence there in, in the hospital room in Plattsburgh. Lord God, I pray, would you meet her? Lord God, I pray that she would just Know your love and your goodness and your faithfulness. She might be able to say with, join, join in the testimony of saints throughout the ages. God is good. God is faithful. Amen. <clears throat> hey, uh, a few announcements before we dive into the word this morning. The first one is we are putting together a Christmas Eve choir. Just to, to sing through two or three songs as, as we celebrate the season. The choir is going to meet for practices on Yes, December. Those are Tuesday evenings, December 7th, 14th, and 21st, as well as a quick run through. Hey, Nelson, I think it's a little hot. If you could just turn it down a touch. 
a quick run through after the service on December 19th. Um, if, if you're interested in joining, it would be good to be able to make at least a couple of those. There is a sign up online. Shoot me a message if you're interested and didn't get that link last week when I sent it out in an email. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Also, speaking of Christmas related happenings, the arts program of Northern New York is putting on a Christmas carol. This is the second time two years ago we did this show. And uh, the arts program is a ministry of the church. We're going to put this production on over at CFC Madrid. That's happening December 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. There's going to be five performances, actually, over those four days. And uh, so there are lots of opportunities to see it. It's it's really fun. I was in it a couple of years ago, and it was a blast. I'm kind of bummed I wasn't able to be in it this year, but I'm looking forward to watching it. And uh, it, it's just it's really well done. Lots of people involved. Um, not many people from Canton. Are you girls in it? Okay, and I know Rob's in it. I don't see him this morning. So a, a few Canton members, but but uh, members from CFC, all the lo- various locations. It's going to be a blast. I want to highly encourage you to make it out if you're able. But not only that, this is one of those opportunities. We don't do, well, there just hasn't been much in terms of community events, period. Uh, but this is one of those opportunities where invite a coworker, invite a neighbor, find somebody who might not ordinarily be interested in coming to a worship gathering or to hear the Bible preach, but they might be interested in kind of checking out what's going on at CFC and see a show. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So use this as a, a bridge building networking opportunity. And, and ultimately, man, Christmas could easily devolve to just kind of a fun, heartwarming season. But what an opportunity we have to bring it back to Jesus again and again and again. Jesus came. We're celebrating Jesus, and Jesus wasn't just another person. People are born every day, and that's great. But, like, Jesus is the Savior of the world. We just went through judges over the past couple of months. And again and again and again, we see a need for a deliverer for the people of God. And Jesus is that perfect, ultimate, eternal Savior. So uh, lots to celebrate and many opportunities. One more note, kind of looking way ahead. Next May, Eric Trelease who's one of the pastors here at CFC. He's over at the Potsdam location. Eric spent several years in Turkey doing church planning and missions work, and he's going to bring a team of uh, people over to Turkey this coming May just to, to serve some churches and partner with them in what God's doing. If that's, like, even interesting to you, which, by the way, I hope it is. Like, we are part of what God's doing around the globe, and it's pretty awesome that we have opportunities to, to give, to pray, and to even go and to serve. Uh, churches throughout the globe. Over the past 20 years, CFC has sent teams to Nepal, China, Mexico, Honduras, Colombia, Spain, Turkey, Armenia, Lebanon, like just all over the place. And uh, God is doing stuff. It's really exciting. And this is an opportunity. If you're interested, if you've been uh, thinking about missions and you're interested in this this trip, get a hold of Eric because he'll kind of put together the details based on who's available and what works schedule-wise. If you need Eric's contact info, look in the church directory or ask me. I have his number. Um, Brilliance. One more note. We aren't passing a bucket to collect an offering regularly anymore, but we do have a box in the back and also you can give online. And giving is healthy. It's important. It's certainly necessary to sustain the work, but it's also... It's an act of worship for us as children of God to say, Lord, we're just, we're, what we have is not our own. We are stewards. We're going to, to use this, these, these monies and resources that you've given us for your glory uh, to, to worship you and honor you. And part of our regular worship with our finances is regularly supporting local church. Um, we are a generous church. I want to thank you for your regular giving. I want to encourage you to, can you, to, con- to continue to give as an act of worship unto the Lord. Don't just give out of compulsion or, oh, this is what we do. We're Christians. We give 10%. Like, give as worship unto the Lord. Let's pray. Amen. Lord God, I do thank you that uh, certainly we can worship in a special way with music, and we see that in Scripture, and we experience that regularly, Lord, but our lives are worship, or ought to be, everything that we do. And Lord, we thank you for the resources and provision that you've provided for us. We recognize that our lives are not our own. Nothing we have is ours. We want to worship you and honor you. And as we give regularly, Lord, I pray, would you help us to give cheerfully? Would you help us to give as worship? We love you and we bless you. 
Amen. Excellent. Hey, I'm going to switch mics. We're testing. You may have noticed we've made some sound system changes in the past couple of weeks, and I'll continue that thought in a second. speakers will allow us to have the room volume level slightly quieter and more even. And if you think about it, that makes sense. And, uh, but please get, give, uh, give feedback. I, I, would, I don't get to stand where all y'all are. So let me know. We're also trying a drum kit, which adds a lot more like flavor and different kinds of energy, which I think is fun and exciting and it's biblical to worship with cymbals, but at the same time, we don't have to. If the drums don't work, we'll scratch them. Uh, but So give me some feedback. I heard feedback from a few people this past week regarding volume levels and mix and things like that. Please continue to give it to us. Realize it might, it's going to be a process as we, we work through things and navigate. We want to have a, 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 a ga- time of corporate musical worship that is that is vibrant, that is energetic, that we're, we're doing our best just to make a joyful noise, but also something that's certainly accessible to everyone and we can all participate in and enjoy Jesus together through. So I don't know what you're thinking unless you tell me. So please give me, give me feedback throughout the week. If you have any thoughts or suggestions and be patient with us as it might take weeks or months as we work through some of the ideas. Amen. Well, today... We're going to look at Psalm 62 together. So if you could turn over to Psalm 62. And uh, you certainly don't have to the entire time, but I would encourage you, if you have a Bible, uh, there will be the passage on the screen, but if you have a Bible, have it handy, because a couple of times I think it'll be helpful to be able to actually look at the psalm. One of the things we see with psalms are, well, they're not just conveying information. The structure of the psalm itself conveys something. It's, It's poetic. It's like a song or a piece, like a poem. And, and one of the things you see in Psalms is you see phrases and themes and, and k- kind of like you see couplets and triads and sandwiching ideas. And in addition to what the words are saying, the structure of the psalm says something. And so I will want to reference that later. If you do have a Bible, keep it handy. Psalm 62 is a psalm about trusting God. Trusting God. And if you know anything about following Jesus and walking with the Lord, you have heard that we can and we should trust God. So you're probably not going to learn tons of novel information this morning. Um, But there is a reality of walking in trust with God that is, it's like, Easier said than done. It's one of those those scenarios. It's not that complicated, but it's hard. It's difficult. It's a day by day. And and the reality is there are really difficult moments in life. But I want to speak even more generally. Maybe you're in the midst of a difficult moment, but the reality is for all of us, you live a little bit of life, and there are just pressures and stressors, and you kind of, you start... If, if we're not actively running to the Lord and trusting him, we start carrying just the way of the world is super hyperbolic. But it feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? Maybe you've even had this phenomenon where you try to, like, relax and you, like, feel like you're getting more stressed. Has anybody had that happen? Like, I'll just, like, try to relax and I feel like my neck is tighter and I get, like, sick feeling. I'm like, oh, I should just stop relaxing. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's weird how you just... you. We can carry so much weight, life, it's, it's pressures, worries about the future, worries about the present, disappointments from the past, you know, the questions about cars and bills and health issues and relationship complications. And just like life has this way of, we need to run to the Lord and trust him. And then on top of the normal stuff, whether or not you've been through it recently, we all go through those major life moments. Um, death of loved ones, major disappointments, plans not working out. Um, Life is full of difficulties. And this shouldn't surprise us as Christians. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good, good cheer, for I've overcome the world. We have hope in Jesus. We can trust the Lord in the midst of it. And we can walk in peace and joy and strength. 
But if we're not trusting God, wow, that, that pressure comes on, that stress, that anxiety. And so I want to call us, church, to trust God today. I want to read through Psalm 62, then work through it verse by verse just to make sure we understand all the ideas, and then step back and consider the psalm as a whole. Look a little bit at the structure and what this is saying to us, and then talk about application. Um, let's pray, and we will read the psalm together. Lord God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you are our Heavenly Father, whom we can trust. Lord, even as we've reiterated multiple times already this morning, you are good and you are faithful. Um, but Lord, the, the reality is we can know that and still walk through today in our own strength. Carry these, these burdens and these pressures and these stresses, Lord, on our own and... Lord, I pray, would you help us to trust you today? Lord, not to lean on our own understanding, not to, not to walk in our own strength, but to trust you in everything. Lord, I pray in that, Lord, would you meet us um, with joy and peace, Lord God, and strength and provision. Lord, we trust you. Amen. Psalm 62. For the choir director, according to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. How long will you threaten a man? Will all of you attack as if he were a leaning wall or a tottering fence? They only plan to bring him down from his high position. They take pleasure in lying. They're, they bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. Selah. Rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. My salvation and glory depend on God, my strong rock. My refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. Selah. Common people are only a vapor. Important people an illusion. Together on a scale, they weigh less than a vapor. Place no trust in oppression or false hope in robbery. If wealth increases, don't set your heart on it. God has spoken once. I have heard this twice. Strength belongs to God, and faithful love belongs to you, Lord, for you repay each according to his works. Amen. I love this psalm. You know, even as I was preparing this week, again and again, I found myself just reading this aloud as I was praying to the Lord and, and the Holy Spirit just ministering to me as I meditated on his word. And I, I would encourage the same to you, but we'll get to application more later. Psalm 62 begins with a, a, a title and description. For the choir director stand, according to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. Not every psalm, but many of the psalms have some sort of directive or note. At the beginning, in this case, we see that David wrote this psalm. Um, David wrote many psalms, not all of them. Some were written by Asaph and others by like various sons of Korah, I think. And, and some were unsure who wrote them. But this one was written by David, and he was directing it to this guy named Jeduthun. And uh, in First Chronicles, second. <laughs> Excuse me. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 42, we see a reference to this guy. And he helped with corporate worship. Heman and Jeduthun had with them trumpets and cymbals to play and musical instruments of God. Jeduthun's sons were at the city gates. It's just kind of an in passing. But just to give a little bit of context, sometimes I think we read the Psalms and we just like, oh, that's great. This was like a worship chorus that they used. The people of God, just like we sing many choruses today, many of them written heavily with influence by the Psalms. In fact, one of the Psalms, songs we sang today had a very like Psalm-like parallel in it, like talking to the soul. What song was that? Does anybody remember? It's like the third song we sang. What? Sing his praise again. Yes. I mean, if, if you look at some of these songs, you're like, oh, wow, the, the people who write, the, there are so many great choruses today. And the people writing these choruses, they know their scriptures. And in fact, often we're kind of like, is this biblical? It's like, yeah, the reference is like 20 verses. And uh, it's a very psalm-like pattern here. 
This was a psalm used by the people of God to declare God's goodness, his faithfulness, and the reality that we can trust him. Verse 1. I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. Rest. You could also translate this peace. I'm at peace in God alone. Rest is hard for us. I'm sure this is a a, a human difficulty or human challenge throughout the ages, but it seems especially today, we're in the midst of a, a cultural moment where few of us know how to work hard and few of us know how to rest well. We're kind of like constantly in this middle where we're kind of working and kind of like feeling pressure, but not actually like it's... There is an important lesson for us, church, to bring to the world around us and to make sure we're not influenced in the wrong direction regarding. That is, we are called to work hard and to rest well. And our rest, it, ultimately, it comes from God. Um, you know, binging a Netflix series all night is not great rest. You just end up exhausted and fried the next day. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with watching a show, but like, that, that's how our generation <laughs> knows how to rest. Just like waste time and fry yourself. Uh, we need to learn how to rest, and our rest comes in the Lord. You're feeling exhausted? Well, taking a nap might be helpful, but spend some time with Jesus. Read, read some of the Psalms aloud. Just bless the Lord. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for peace and for joy. I am at rest. This is a, a statement, a fact. I am at rest in God alone. I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. Now, certainly, it is true and it is important and amen that we are saved from our sins and saved into eternal life by the work of Jesus. But there is, there is like a salvation every day that we need. Deliverance from the pressures of life. And, and many of the Psalms of David, this one not explicitly, but you can see the influence, even as he references God being like a fortress later. They're shaped by the reality David was living through warfare, people trying to kill him, you know, on the run from Saul for years. But even once he was king and taking ground and defeating the Philistines, like some of the pressures of his life were literally like somebody's trying to kill me today. <laughs> like that's the kind of pressure. And the Lord is my savior. He is my deliverer. There's an ultimate salvation that comes in Jesus. But church, the good news is that today, I don't know what you're facing. Maybe you're just carrying the pressures of life. Maybe you're facing a very acute and specific challenge. God is the answer. Our rest comes from him. Our salvation comes from him alone. And this word alone here in verse 1. I am at rest in God alone. It is a word repeated a number of times in the psalm. It's only a 12-verse psalm. And this, this verse appears like five or six times. And there's like this emphasis, this, this emphatic nature, like God alone. He alone is my, my rest, my salvation. Verse 2, he alone, speaking of alone, he alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. Other things might bring a sense of rest for a moment, but we find true peace and true rest in Jesus. There's a familiar verse in Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, that just like, they capture the sense of God brings us peace as we walk with him. Isaiah 26, 3, You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace, for it is trusting in you. Trust in the Lord forever, because in the Lord, the Lord himself is an everlasting rock. And, and David, in, in verse 2, he references God being like a stronghold. And again, this is one of those words that uh, I, th I think we get, but I, I have to be honest, like, I've never had to, like, I've never been fighting for my life. <laughs> and, like, there are enemies without. And I can only imagine I suspect most of us are in the same camp. I can only imagine the sense of, of peace and, and safety and belonging when you're inside a well-guarded fortress. You know, today, maybe a fortress doesn't mean much unless you're in a bunker like hundreds of feet underground because of missiles and things like that. But back then, in the ancient, in ancient warfare, 
a city was pretty much, the way you attack a city is you'd lay siege to it for years. They had some primitive siege works, but just think about the story of Troy, right? The, the battle with the Trojan horse. The Greeks were attacking Troy for 10 years. And eventually they're like, we're never going to get in here. So they feigned a withdrawal. They left a gift, the Trojan horse, with, I don't know, like a dozen warriors in it. The Trojans, for whatever reason, I don't even know if it's true, it might be like mythological, but they bring the horse inside the city. At night, the, the rest of the army, the, the Greeks, return. They, they disembark from their boats. The guys inside the Trojan horse get out, open the gates, they sack the city. Like as soon as the, the city gates were opened, Troy fell. There's a refuge that, again, I don't, I don't know if we can really fully understand, but David's thinking, man, I've been out there on the open battlefield. Our God's like being inside a secure city. There, there is safety. There is belonging. There is, he is our fortress, our solid rock. Verse 3, how long will you threaten a man? Now, this is interesting that the psalmist, uh, it, it's almost like he begins talking to his opposition, to those who would, who would be out to take his life, to the situations and, and pressures that we face. How long will you threaten a man? Will all of you attack as if he were a leaning wall or a tottering fence? And he gives this picture. I don't know if you guys have ever, hmm, let me use an example. Like uh, if you wrestle, uh, Coach Clark has some experience. Um, I, I did some like wrestling practices a few times. And what I real, re learned the hard way and very quickly is that if you stand up tall when you wrestle, you go down fast. <laughs> like you, you can't have your, your center of gravity like high because you're like a leaning wall or a tottering fence. A little push and you go over. You want to you know, get, get down low, lower the center of balance, get, get that athletic stance, that posture. I, I was playing tackle football in college without pads, because that's what smart people do. <laughs> and uh, I went in to, to attack this dude, or like, not attack, sorry, tackle this guy. And he was big, but he wasn't that big. He maybe was like 220 pounds. But he was like an all-American football player from somewhere in Tennessee. And I was a uh, never-played football player who was not athletic from Madrid, New York. And uh, <laughs> I go in and I just, I mean, I, I think I would have taken out a lot of people, but this guy knew how to use his body. And it was like, you know, it was, again, he wasn't huge, but he's was like 220 maybe. And he just leaned his shoulder into me and I got leveled and definitely concussed. Life happens. But uh, the point is, David's painting this picture. Like, you can attack somebody when they're weak, when they're vulnerable. Like, it's like pushing a, a, a leaning wall or a tottering fence. Is that the term? Like th this enemy, this opposition, they'll try to take you out when you're weak. Verse 4. They only plan to bring him down from his high position. He, and now he's saying they'll take you out when you're weak, but they'll also take you out when you're strong. Like this enemy, they're going to attack. The, the nature is they are opposed. Jesus said we have an enemy. And guess what he's out to do? Steal, kill, and destroy. I don't, I don't care if you're in a weak place in life or a strong place in life. The enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. The, the answer is kind of always the same. What's the enemy trying to do? Take you out. I don't know if you've ever heard one of those, you know, silly math setups. If you know much about math, you understand exactly how this works. But think of a number. A simple one because you're going to do some arithmetic with it. Maybe between like 5 and 15. Think of a number. All y'all. This is amazing. This is a room of like 70 people. And I am going to tell you the final number that's going to be in your mind. So think of a number. Now take that number and multiply it by three. So take your original number, multiply it by three, and now you have the answer. Add six. Now divide that answer by three. Take, it, take a second. So you start with a number. Multiply it by three, add six, now divide by three. And now subtract your original number. Don't tell me what it is, but does anybody have the, the answer so far? Okay, a few of you guys? Two. And if you understand math, you know exactly how it works. Okay, so, um, but like... No matter what number, you can start with like 17,214, and the answer is two. It, it's remarkable, right? It's just a little math trick. But it, it, the psalmist is saying, I don't care what position I'm in. 
There is an enemy that is opposed to me. I could be in a weak place, he's going to attack. I could be in a strong place, he's going to attack. Then he talks about the, the character of this opposition. They take pleasure in lying. They bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. This is verse 4. They take pleasure in lying. They bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. Selah. Verse 5. Rest in God alone, my soul. Rest in, now, now you'll notice, the, the acute observer will see, verses 5 and 6 are almost identical to verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 started with, uh, I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. Verse 2, he alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. And verses 5 and 6 are the exact same thing with like two different words. And one of them is this. Note this. Verse 1 says, I am at rest in God alone. Verse 5 says, rest in God alone. It changes from a statement of, there's a reality, my peace is found in Jesus, to find peace in Jesus. Come on, soul. <laughs> Rest in God alone, my soul. The, 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 the psalmist moves from stating a, a reality, and this, this is the parallel in the song we sang earlier. There's like almost this command to ourselves, and we need to hear that sometimes. And I'm saying, like, hear that. Talk to yourself. Be one of those crazy people. You'll be a healthy person. <laughs> Tell your soul what to do. Rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. It's a familiar refrain. And one of the things you're going to see, and we'll look at it very closely in a moment, but you'll see there are a couple of verses that are testifying of God's goodness and his faithfulness, and we can trust him. Then a couple of verses talking about the opposition, the difficulty in life. And then a couple of verses kind of repeating the, we can trust in the Lord. And then it does that exact same pattern. So we have five and six, but then seven and eight. My salvation and glory depend on God. My strong rock, my refuge is in God. He moves from exhorting himself, rest in the Lord, my soul, or rest in God, to talking to others. My salvation and my glory depend on God. My strong rock, my refuge is in God. Verse 8, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. Trust him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. There's this, this notion of pouring your heart out. Again, it's, it's a metaphor. We can't actually, hopefully, don't pour your actual heart out. But it's, it is calling for this, it is a visceral picture like something gushing out of me before the Lord. Pour your hearts out before him. Pour your hearts out before him. I've got news for you. I, I could teach on this for like five hours. And if we then live the next week and we're not telling our soul to rest in God, and we're not pouring our hearts out before the Lord, this is all for naught. I don't intend to share anything this morning that's going to be new to any of us. This is, a, this is an exhortation, church. Let's walk with Jesus. Let's walk with Jesus. Let's trust the Lord. When difficulties come up, you want to, just as we always know the answer when we ask what the enemy's up to. In a weak place, he's going to attack. In a strong place, he's going to attack. We always know the answer when we ask what's the solution. It's Jesus. Run to God. He is our refuge. He is our refuge deliverer. Verse 8, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. Selah. This is the second time we saw the word Selah, and it's common in the Psalms. This might be new to you. What does Selah mean? We don't know. <laughs> uh, if you look up the word Selah in various Hebrew lexicons, you'll find anything from bless the Lord to it's a pause in the music to, it's a command in the poetry to reflect on what you've been reading. Like, and so I would say, let's just say amen to all of that. God is good. Pause. Reflect. <laughs> uh, God is our refuge. Selah. Verse 9. Common people are only a vapor. Important people, an illusion. What he's saying here is like, nobody really matters compared to God. <laughs> you might be a nobody, you might be a somebody, you're not that significant. God is God, 
We are people. Together on a scale, they weigh less than a vapor. You know, this picture reminds me of a picture that we see in Daniel chapter 2. Um, there, there's a dream, and I'm not going to give all the backstory, but in the dream, it's a vision from God, a dream from God, excuse me, and God gives Daniel the interpretation. And in the dream, there's this statue composed of various materials, like heavy materials, like iron and gold and clay and things like that. But, but in the midst of it, like they, they, they almost become like the chaff and are carried away by the wind, and they represent different kingdoms, and they're replaced by, an, by a kingdom that lasts forever. They're replaced by the eternal kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus is establishing. So Daniel chapter two, chapter 2, I just want to read like six verses. Verse 32. The head of the statue was pure gold. Have you ever carried a brick of gold? You can go to like a mints and stuff and like pick up a brick of gold. A, like a brick, like probably this size but more brick shaped. <laughs> so taller and narrower. You pick up a brick and it is heavy. It's pretty done stuff. It's also like tens of thousands of dollars. It's kind of cool to hold. But like, you can go to the Canadian Mint once the border's open. When does the border open for the U.S. side? I think like early December. Anyway, there's a mint in Ottawa. Super cool. I highly recommend it. Also tour Parliament building. It's fun. Um, but like, you, you pick up the bricks are, a golden brick is heavy. This is dense material. So here we have the statue. The head was pure gold. Its chest and arms were silver, its stomach and thighs were bronze, its legs were iron, and its feet were partly iron and partly fired clay. This is a heavy structure. I don't, it, it, it could be like a statue that small, and it's going to be wicked heavy, but it wasn't. It was like this big behemoth representing multiple kingdoms. Uh, verse 35, 34. As you were watching, a stone broke off without a hand touching it, struck the statue on its feet of iron and fired clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the fired clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were shattered and became like chaff, which is like, almost like, just like bits of grain and like leaves, just like particles that would float away across a field. They became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away, and not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Jumping ahead to verse 44. In the days of those kings, the God of the heavens will set up a kingdom. And Daniel says, like, those different parts of the statue represent different kingdoms. And he says, in the days of those kings, the God of the heavens will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. You saw a stone break off from the mountain without a hand touching it. And it crushed the iron, the bronze, fired clay, silver, and gold. The great God has told the king what will happen in the future. The dream is certain and its interpretation reliable. You know, to us, it seems like the, the, the people around us, the institutions around us, the systems in which we live, the, the principalities that, that oppose the people of God, it might seem like they are some hefty, imposing structure. But man, compared to God, they're lighter than a vapor. <laughs> compared to God, he could blow those pieces of gold and metal and iron, just they get carried away in the breeze. And the psalmist is saying, man, these people, common people, powerful people, they're lighter than vapor on a scale compared to God. Verse 10, place no trust in oppression or false hope in robbery. And, and clearly oppression and robbery are vile tactics, but it kind of represents just humans trying to do what they can to, to use their own devices to to control things and to protect themselves and to, to serve themselves. And he's saying, place no trust in oppression or false hope in robbery. If wealth increases, don't set your heart on it. David knew poverty. He knew literally running for his life for years and living in caves. He also knew, man, at the height of his kingdom, he probably would be considered a billionaire by today's standards. Like, he knew poverty, he knew wealth, and he's saying, if your wealth increases, don't set your heart on it. And man, it is easy to set your heart on it. I don't care if you're rich or if you're poor, it's really easy to be like, oh, if, if I had this, then my problems would be solved. I got news. You need Jesus for your problems to be solved. There's nothing bad about money, but the love of money, setting your hope in money, it fails. And not only does it fail, it leads, leads to all kinds of brokenness. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, 
and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Back to Psalm 62, verse 11. God has spoken once. I have heard this twice. I'm not going to lie. This is the line in the psalm that I'm not 100% sure what it means. <laughs> uh, I looked it up in multiple commentaries. I've thought about it. I've been praying it and reading it. I think this is simply what it is. I'm pretty sure it's a poetic way of saying, I know that I know. He's not really saying God's only said this once. He's not really saying he heard it twice. It, it's a poetic way of saying, this is what God said, and I know it. Like, I heard this once, twice. I know that I know. Um, I'm not very poetic, though, so I have a hard time with poetry. <laughs> Verse 11, God has spoken once, I have heard this twice, strength belongs to God, and faithful love belongs to you, Lord, for you repay each according to his works. God is powerful, God is loving, God is just and fair. In contrast to those who, who bless with their words but curse in their heart, those who use robbery and oppression and hope and riches, God is powerful. He's actually of substance not just a vapor. God is good. God is loving. This is a, his faithful love. Faithful love belongs to God. And he repays each according to his works. And that's a line embracing, it's not discussing ultimate judgment. It's saying God's fair. God's just. He doesn't pervert justice. So I want to step back, look at the structure of the psalm briefly, and then read it together and talk a little bit of application. The next slide, Sheila, if you can throw that up. What we see is this arrangement. It's a, it's a chiastic structure. And you see it's almost like an A, B, A, and then an A, B, A, and they're, they're nested. So you have two A's in the middle. And, and what it's kind of doing is saying we're going to begin by proclaiming God's goodness, the, the reality that there is peace and there is rest in God alone. But then we're going to discuss the difficulties a little bit. There are people who are opposed to us. There's an enemy who's out to get us. There are difficulties in life. And then the psalmist switches back and he says, but the, the substance of this psalm, the message of the psalm, two A's together. And, and the A's are a proclamation of just the testimony of trust in God. And he says, uh, there's an exhort, exhortation both to himself, soul, rest in God. Rest in God, my soul. And then there's an exhortation to the people's. All you peoples, pour out your hearts before him. Right? There, there, there's this exhortation that's like the heart of the psalm. And then he moves on and he just recognizes the reality, the, the truth of our reality. That we can, we can chase after providing for ourselves, but it just leads to more heartache and brokenness and oppression and robbery and wealth. It doesn't satisfy. And then he concludes, as he began, a proclamation of God's goodness. So I want to read the whole psalm again, now that we hopefully have a bit of understanding what the, what the psalmist is talking about, see the structure. I want to read the psalm and then talk application. Psalm 62. For the choir director, according to Jedithan, a psalm of David, I am at rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will never be shaken. How long will you threaten a man? Will all of you attack as if he were a leaning wall or a tottering fence? They only plan to bring him down from his high position. They take pleasure in lying. They bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. Selah. Rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. My salvation and glory depend on God. My strong rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. Selah. Common people are only a vapor. Important people, an illusion. Together on a scale, they weigh less than a vapor. Place no trust in oppression or false hope in robbery. If wealth increases, don't set your heart on it. God has spoken once. I have heard this twice. Strength belongs to God, and faithful love belongs to you, Lord. For you repay each 
according to his works. Amen. It's a great, great psalm, great admonition. At the heart of the psalm, those verses 5, 6, 7, 8, kind of like the, the AA in the middle, there are exhortations. Exhortation by the psalmist to himself, an exhortation by the psalmist to the people of God. Rest in God alone, my soul, for my hope comes from him. Stop trusting in yourself and humbly let go of control. You, you know, there, there are some classic pictures for putting control of God, it, putting your life in God's hands. And uh, they're tried and true and a little cheesy, but also really intuitive. One of those pictures is to give God the wheel. <laughs> it's like, who's in control of this car? And uh, let, like, give, give the wheel to the Lord. But do you know what can happen really easily? We're like, God, you've got the wheel. And then we like keep a couple fingers on it, just in case. <laughs> like I just this one area of my life. Or 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 you could imagine, you could imagine your difficulties, your questions, your concerns, your, your stress being like a box and saying, like, hey God, uh, here it is. And then you're gonna try to grab it back. I feel like somebody just said that to me recently. And like the, the, we say we're gonna trust God, but then we don't really. And so there's this exhortation: rest in God alone, my soul. For my hope comes from him. Verse 6, he alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I will not be shaken. What there is, is there's this repeating the truth about who God is. A meditating on on his goodness, on the reality of his his greatness, his faithfulness, his mercy. And I would say, church, we need to actually let go and trust God. And part of how we do that is through prayer, meditating on his word. Say it out loud. You don't have to pray out loud to pray. But man, it's helpful. (laughs) It's helpful. I would encourage you, pray out loud. And if you're kind of like, well, I'm like in a room with somebody else. Well, pray with them. Or if you're doing different things, go into another room and like pray. Pull up your phone if you have to. Talk to God. (laughs) Like actually articulate, Jesus, my hope is in you. My strength is in you are my refuge. Just start meditating and and declaring this reality. Something happens when we articulate the truth. And that's what the psalmist is doing here. He's like, I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. Because i got to meditate on these truths. This helps me walk in a trust for the Lord. Verse 7, my salvation and glory depend on God. My strong rock, my refuge is in God continue in this. The psalmist doesn't cease to declare God's goodness. So often, I do this, and I think it's a human thing. I kind of like, I, in sports, there's a reason for this, but it often is annoying. When you start winning, you change your strategy. You like have a game plan, you get the edge, and then you switch game plans. And it's really annoying when your team does that and then they lose. You're like, dude, what you were doing was working. You were winning like with the initial game plan and you switched it. And I know why they do it. It's it's statistics. But I feel like so often we do that in life. We're like, I need Jesus. It's it's that judges cycle. Wow, I may have actually said this when I was preaching judges a few weeks ago. Sorry, but hopefully it's a good reminder. It's that judges cycle. We like, we recognize our need for the Lord. We, we, We repent. We run to Jesus. We submit to him. God brings deliverance. He is our savior. And and we start walking in peace and freedom. And then we're like, okay, new game plan. I'm going to stop running to Jesus. Like I got this now. I'm like, why? Just keep walking in repentance, walk in humility, walk in a, just a a prayer that's saying, Jesus, I need you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to look to you. Don't switch when God meets you and brings peace and be like, I guess I don't have to do that anymore. Like, don't change the game plan. And the psalmist, this is a bit of a repetitive psalm. It's a short one, but it's repetitive. The psalmist is saying, I'm not changing game plans. I I said it once, but I'm going to say it again. And then I'm going to say it slightly differently. Then I'm going to say it again. And like, I'm going to meditate on this truth. Verse 8, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. Selah. Pour out your hearts before him. This, the teaching we find in the psalm is not complicated. It's it's not hard to grasp or understand. It requires walking out. It is futile unless we actually embrace this. Pour out your hearts before him. Church, I want to 
challenge us. Spend time with Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. Pray in the car on the way to work. Pray when you're taking a shower, when you get ready for bed. Like, find times, and, and not just like an in-passing, like, God help me. Those are good too. But like, some, some time where we can really pour our hearts out before the Lord. Say, Lord, this is, this is what's hitting me, and I just, I'm going to bring it to you, and I'm going to start declaring your goodness, your greatness, your faithfulness. Give thanks. Thanksgiving should be like half of your prayer life. Just thanking God for his presence, thanking God for his mercy and his faithfulness. Bring it to Jesus. We're called to walk with the Lord. We're called to walk with the Lord. I want to call the worship team to come on back up. Let's start now, church. Let's start now. Just uh, expressing our love for the Lord, meditating on the truth regarding who he is, putting our trust in him. Putting our trust in him. Let's bow our heads and pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the reality that we can trust you. Lord, that, that as we go through life and we feel the, the pressures and the, the disappointments and the difficulties and the challenge, and some of it's just life, and some of it is there is an enemy who is out to steal, kill, and destroy. There is real opposition. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and spirits. Lord Jesus, there is a real war going on. Lord, and in the midst of this, we declare that you are good. There is peace in you and you alone. There is rest in you, Jesus. I pray, Lord, would you lead us, your people. Lead us by still waters. Lord, I thank you that you've called us into relationship with yourself. And at that core of the, that relationship is walking in dependence on you, walking in trust towards you. Lord, I, I repent for where I've grabbed back at those, those burdens and those stresses, put my hand on the wheel, so to speak. Lord Jesus, we trust you today. Pour our hearts out before you. Lord, I pray, would you help us to walk in this? I don't want to change the game plan up after you've met me. I want to continue to walk with you day by day. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand up, church, and close with a chorus. It's worshiping Jesus.
what I want to do as we approach the close here is just take a moment. We all need prayer today. (laughs) Maybe find somebody next to you, just put a hand on their shoulder, pray for them, bless them in the name of Jesus. Ask God to just pour out grace upon them. Let's take a minute and pray for one another, church. If you're praying, feel free to continue. But uh, I'm going to dismiss the service at this time. Greet somebody, bless somebody, go in the peace of Jesus. Let's walk in true peace and rest as we trust the Lord every day. Amen.